Good afternoon everyone. So today I thought I would do something a little briefer and slightly more um, self-indulgent because honestly I think it can get a little vexing for we to persist continuously in the study of a singular text even one as um, elucidating as ethics of the real. So I made a small um, discursion so to speak. Self-Design or Productive Narcissism by Boris Kreuz. And you can imagine how contemporary such a piece may be. This was a text that appeared in a publication titled Superhumanity, Design of the Self in 2018. It is part of a few compilatory publications released by the electronic journal Eflux and printed by MIT Press. In introducing narcissism and its productivization, as it were, in recent years, Boris Kreuz presents the fact that what makes desire truly human, as opposed to animalistic desire, which destroys its object, is the fact that in a relation with another, we desire not only the body, but the desire of the other. In other words, Anthropogenic desire is not merely for other objects, but for being desired. This, as it were, would appear to be a social bond in narcissism. In pursuit of this, we may be led to present ourselves as an object to society. Yet more importantly, the desire for desire produces self-consciousness. And even the self as such, an insight which Groys attributes to Kozhev. He that is the author, Groys, does recognize a degree of alienation which may be inherent in this effort for the desire of the other. In this sense, it sacrifices natural needs for an abstract idea of recognition. Paradoxically, we are pointed out to the fact that our present day narcissus is because of the forementioned social dimension in desire, interested in the survival and well-being of society. A belief in God meant that the subject wanted to be loved, or at least recognized by God. The relationship between a subject to society was ethical in this mediated sense in which one's acts of worship were directed at God, even if done in society. You may imagine the sense of loss then when the death of God dawned as the divine gaze for which the soul had been edified for centuries was no more. The ethical bond which may have once characterized our commitments was replaced by an erotic one. Subjectivity became a question of design, manifested as it were in the clothes they wore and in the spaces they inhabited. The last theological question that remained was whether any encounter with the real was still possible amidst the omnipresent fabrication of surfaces. Death in the absence of God becomes the temporal horizon which haunts society as it pines for its love of the other which sustains it. And I suppose you may even say that the other, at some very gross moment, would even be materialized into an object in this sense, in a um, brutally materialistic reduction of, you know, social relations, obligations, duties and debt and so on. The post-human condition, as it were, in the absence of God, 
does not mark the advent of self-design with churches and palaces possibly preceding design and art museums as exhibits or public monuments to recent trends of the soul, if you please. <clears throat> I think this is an important point to raise, particularly coming from someone such as Boris Groys, who is an art critic and who would be in some senses familiar with the um, the political ramifications of art, having lived through the rise and, uh, well, not the rise, but the political antagonism between the Soviet Union and the uh, Western powers, and of course the demise of the Soviet Union and what was to become of Russia after that. The post-human condition, as it were, in the absence of God, does not mark the advent of self-design with churches and palaces possibly preceding design and art museums as exhibits or public monuments to recent trends of the soul, if you please. Yet here, we may truly gain more from private practices which have often developed elaborate disciplines that have prefigured the post-human. And here, of course, I would add everything from epistolary uh, epistolary novels to, of course, um, literature, stream of consciousness, maybe even some travel writings, but also fairly bodily practices such as things like yoga, which has become so much more easily circulatable with platforms such as YouTube. And these, of course, were very much with us prior to any disintegration of the idea of the divine or uh, dawning of the post-human, so to speak. Choice of articles, tastes, etc. are general use of things constitute semblance of what this may mean. And this consumption is of course tied to its own productions, which are most no noticeably um, representative of this self being refashioned. Artwork, photos, narratives, books, whose circulation has opened windows for the mind in our contemporary moment. As they are dispersed globally, these new bodies which emerge, as it were, are fragmented in their act of dispersal retaining perhaps only a virtual unity, inaccessible to the human gaze, and whose traces may be only gathered by search programs such as Google. A semblance is hence recognized by a semblance. The author quotes Leotard on the internet, mankind's persistence in a state of explosion. And I suppose there was a time when Marx spoke about the alienation of a worker from a product. And in some ways this was reflected in the worker as an alienation of a worker from themselves in the sense that what tied them to each other were bonds which were reflected into objects that they were making. Yet today we have a, a situation where even representations are necessarily foreclosed in the sense that they become fragments of what is possible in any possible representation. The bond that a thing has, a thing as a serial, as a person, as an object, as a narrative, as a testimony, become in some ways aspects of the frame which views it and in this sense the context becomes in some sense, the guiding principle of how any given person actually is able to put forth a point of view. And some people, perhaps as early as the late 60s with Guy Debord, would have called this the society of the spectacle. And I think there is much to be gleaned from that and much that has been said about it. And yet, there was also the hope that with 
um, communicational and informational technologies that we have at our hand these days, there would have been some sort of traversal of these fragmentary circumstances. And yet we have seen amidst them the reformulation of rather archaic forms of domination still raising its head. What has permitted for and enabled this commingling is of course the unique um, ball of worms that we call the contemporary. But I would like to, for, in, for instance, encourage, or not just encourage, but even advocately, we even advocate um, thinking in this direction of self-design and productive narcissism, simply because it seems to begin by touching upon an issue which apparently raises an incredible degree of stigma, the idea of, you know, being narcissistically attached to oneself, of caring only for oneself and things of that nature, which in some ways are on the flip side advocately, or rather explicitly advocated by capitalism in its concept of the um, self-driven entrepreneur and everything that entails with that concept. And yet self-design also is a aspect which requires an immense degree of production and it of course spurs industry in directions which had not been open to it earlier. Um, you could of course cite things like spas and uh, improvements in healthcare which have been immense in the recent years. But also closer to home you could of course look at private practices that people may have, um, shared meditations and as I mentioned earlier yoga, maybe private book clubs, meetings between people who share common interests, maybe a cycling club that goes around the neighborhood. These might be actual traces of earlier forms of association between people that have existed and in this sense form something of a tradition which can in some ways reroute a people as they mobilize and reacquaint themselves to new ramifications in their cultural sphere. But there are limitations to any such attempt and the fact that it is brief is also indicative of what kind of tenuousness this ground may hold. There may be new forms of um, insecurity that a person is exposed to. The whole issue of how much of oneself to reveal and things like that. And yet that may be something that we do take up elsewhere. But I did want to introduce this to you. And of course, I shall leave a copy of the text itself in the description. And with that, I would thank you for your time and wish you a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.